Hi, I'm Rich Ribeiro. The Terrell Fund is committed to educating the public about the need to support New Jersey's infants and toddlers right from the start. That's why we're proud to support the important early childhood programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, PNC Bank, RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, and by Guarini Institute for Government and Leadership at St. Peter's University. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey, and by New Jersey Family Magazine and NJFamily.com. This is one-on-one. -on -one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're in Morven, in the Morven Museum and Gardens. We are honored to be joined by the First Lady of the great state of New Jersey, uh, Tammy Snyder. Murphy, good to see you. Thank you for having me. This is an important night. Um, we're not just hanging around at Morven. This is a night to talk about uh, adverse childhood experiences. Uh, a group of folks are getting together as a major grant, a $2 million seed grant from the Burke Foundation, the Nicholson Foundation, to deal with um, these issues around adverse childhood experiences. You care deeply about these children, don't you? Mm -hmm. I do. I do. These, what, what your interpretation of these adverse experiences? We got the clinicians to talk about it, but sure. you care deeply. Uh, well, I would say, you know, these are experiences that um, happen to probably all of us. Um, from what I understand, every two out of three people who you meet have experienced at least one of these horrible uh, situations. And you, if you think about what they are, what is it? It's, it's physical abuse, physical neglect. It's mental abuse and neglect. It's domestic violence. It's, uh, you know, incarceration. It's sexual abuse. It's sexual right. abuse. I mean, they, there's, there's 10 of these adverse um, uh, childhood um, experiences. And, and uh, it's pretty scary to think that two out of three of us have, have, uh, have endured at least one of these. I was talking to the First Lady before we got on the air about our initiative, and you'll see the website uh, on the air, our Right From The Start initiative, funded by um, Terrell and Nicholson and some others. The state government, the Murphy administration, cares deeply about children birth to three. Yes. And their caregivers. Sure. Talk about it. Uh, well, I'd say that, you know, we heard very early on, um, back in January or February, that New Jersey was ranked 45th out of 50th in terms of uh, maternal deaths in the first year of a child's life. And when you dig down, you realize that if you are uh, a, a, you know, it's, it's, it breaks down very, very much along um, racial lines. And if you are a, if you're a black child born in the state of New Jersey, your chances of dying in the first year of life are three times greater than that of a white child. If you're a black mother giving birth in New Jersey, your chances of dying in that child's first year of life are five times greater than that of a white woman's. So given that I'm a mother of four, and Phil is the father of four, um, clearly there's a problem. And so I've been digging in ever since then, and the, the whole, you know, all these things are overlapping. Uh, so the adverse childhood experiences um, is, is yet another factor that plays into this whole problem that we're experiencing here in New Jersey. It's so interesting. As First Lady, you, you could be involved in a lot of things, um, but you choose, I mean, you're involved in a lot of energy policy and environmental policy, but you choose to really put a lot of attention into this area. And I, I, I know there are commissioners, uh, members of the governor's cabinet who we'll be talking to tonight, and we've talked to it other times if you look on our website and right from the start. But you chose to focus on this, and it matters that the First Lady is as involved as you are. Because? I think that uh, the way that I can help is by bringing a spotlight onto this and convening people. 
Uh, I've traveled around the state of New Jersey literally everywhere. I've met with, with people in foundations, people who are providers, NGOs, healthcare systems, uh, nurse practitioners, doulas. I mean, I have seen it all, all around New Jersey. And the most interesting or the most striking uh, tone that I found is a lot of these different providers or people are, are interested in fixing this problem. They're, they are passionate about fixing it. But they each are in their own little silo. So if, they, if someone finds a best practice over here, like down south at Camden, for example, someone up north might be doing the exact same thing, and they may be years behind or maybe doing some, uh, approaching it in a different way, and they aren't getting the benefit of working together. Does it feel like, to some extent, that we're not, I don't know, I could get into a philosophical discussion, that we're sometimes we're not really one state and sharing a lot of information with each other, and, and that we are bifurcated in a lot of ways? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if I would, uh, the, the answer, the short answer is yes. But I would also say, you know, even, even within the administration, you know, we started out with, with two cabinet members who were pretty obvious, Department of Health and Division of Children and Family Services. We thought, okay, those, those two make sense. They, they have overlap here. It's more than that, though, right? But that's, it, there's now 12 different cabinet members involved in this infant and maternal 12. health. 12. Because if you think about it, it's, it's, it's everything from insurance to incarceration to food um, access right. to health care. Um, to, um, I'm just trying to think, of transportation. I mean, all of these things are coming together and working against uh, families and, and um, mothers and their children. By the way, we talked to the Attorney General today. I would argue that there are legal issues as well. Probably are. There probably are. So, so in many ways, because there are so many players, if mm -hmm. you will, in the Murphy administration involved in these issues, does that make it more challenging or a greater opportunity? I think it's a greater opportunity. Talk about that. It's a greater opportunity because everyone wants to fix this. There's not one person who said, sorry, I'm not available for that meeting. So we, we've had, we started off, like I say, there were just three of us um, in the administration. We've now expanded. When we have these meetings, you know, are kind of a, a review of where we are and what we can do next, everyone shows up. Mm. And it's, it's more... Um, it's more a factor of kind of running out of space in the room as opposed to having a lack of interest or a lack of willingness to work together. We recently, I recently had a summit at Drumthwacket uh, and invited all of these different people from all around the state and had, each, had members from each of the different cabinets who were involved at different tables. Um, we, had, we had 12 tables with 12 topics. Each table had questions they had to answer and um, they were working not, in, not as much, which is normal, like all the foundations sitting at one table or all the doulas sitting at one table. I mixed everybody up. You, did, you said let's yes. integrate folks, let's yes. mingle, let's be. That's exactly, that's what I mean when I say I can convene people. You're so. a facilitator. <laughs> a facilitator. Really? Yeah, maybe. So, so, we, so, we, uh, so each table had their own set of questions and they had to come up with, um, they could talk for a while and then at the end they had to come up with kind of short, medium and long term solutions or problems that they couldn't, they couldn't grapple with. And it was fascinating. It was really fascinating. It, the, the summit only lasted um, two or three hours and everybody was, was wishing that it was longer. But I would argue that I'm not sure anyone would have shown up if I'd said it was an all day <laughs> event. But it, it, really, it really worked and we've taken a lot of those suggestions back into the administration now. And we're trying to figure out what can we do? How can we take these all, put them together and come out with the best possible answer? In the time we have with you, because I know there are a lot of other people I want to talk to, I'm curious sure. about this. You and the governor um, have a fascinating, not, fascination not just about people, but about policy, right? About making a difference for people yes. through public policy. Did you both know that early on? I, I can't, I, I mean, I think Phil has always been interested in policy. I mean, he's followed it for his entire life. I would say for me, uh, I, you know, when I meet someone and I can find uh, a lot of, let me, let me put it this way. Phil and I have conversations all the time that'll go like this. This makes, this seems to make a lot of sense. Don't you think so? Hold, hold on, who's saying, wait, I need Phil to Phil will say it or I'll say it. I'll say, this kind of makes sense this notion, let's go in X direction, don't you think? And Phil will say, yeah, why don't you think it's been done before? Or this doesn't make sense, why do you think we're doing it? So we spend a lot of time just trying to say, you know, very basic, you know, kind of just bringing basic thoughts and impulses to everyday experiences and trying to find the best way forward. And, and a lot of times I think that if we all are, you know, 
thoughtful human beings, we can probably move the needle a little bit faster than, than if we get caught up in trying to figure out who said what to whom. Which is not productive. No. I want to thank you very much, you honor us by joining us here at Morven, talking about these most important issues um, affecting our most vulnerable children. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Hi, this is Steve Adubato. We're at uh, Morven Museum and Gardens for a conference, an important meeting on the subject of overcoming childhood adversity and trauma. A whole range of people from across the state, from across the nation, coming to talk about um, children who are affected by toxic stress, if you will, and two of the experts that are joining us here tonight are two longtime friends who have been with us before, uh, Mary and Christopher, Vice President of Community Health at Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield in New Jersey, and Dave Huber, CFO at Horizon. Good to see both of you. Good to see you as well. We we're, were talking right before we got on the air. The issues we're talking about, um, adverse childhood um, impact of, of these events, these, these t horrific events, if you will, otherwise known as ACEs, if you will, right? That's right. Why, was it, why are they a community health issue? Well, they're a community health issue because many of the issues derive from the community and the neighborhood and the blocks in which children live. It's their home that's a, a, an impact, their neighborhoods, their schools. So that's why the solution has to be grassroots and community-based. And, and what's interesting about this is that because there are some corporations, foundations that are here, and by the way, there's $2 million being put up of seed money from the Nicholson Foundation, from the Burke Foundation to deal with this issue. But Horizon has been very much involved in a whole range of um, public spirited efforts, including supporting those of us in public broadcasting. But why is this an issue? These issues around um, adverse childhood effects, right? Uh, these experiences, if you will. Why is it a Horizon issue? I wouldn't say it's a Horizon issue. Why is it it's issue a society issue? Deeply, deeply why do we about? care about this? Yeah. We're in the middle of everything, right? We work with the hospitals, the doctors the members, the community health workers. We got 50% market share. We can make a difference. And we're doing a lot of great things already. Marianne can tell you about that. We think we can take ACEs, integrate it into what we're already doing, and make a big difference for a ton of people. And we're happy to do it. We think it's our responsibility, not alone, but together. We got to collaborate. It's the only way. Talk about this, the ACEs, as Dave talked about, adverse childhood experiences. Again, let's try to be a little more specific. There are 10 of them that, that, that I've read about. Are we talking about if a, if a child has a parent with a substance abuse problem, if a, parent, a child has a parent or parents who are, uh, there's a lot of domestic strife or there's divorce or separation or uh, what other kinds of things are we talking about? Um, it could be the loss of a parent, loss of a sibling, grandparent, violence in neighborhoods, um, poverty. All of those come together to really create the constellation of factors that put children's health at risk in the moment. But I think to your earlier question, why is it important? Because we know that ACEs unaddressed have lifelong impacts on people's physical and, and mental health status. Break it down a little bit. We're talking about heart. The issue of heart disease keeps coming up as well as cancer, correct? Yes, heart disease, How? cancer. That. Because any of these stressors, these toxic stressors, impact negatively the body because it kind of um, drops your immune system, right? Because the immune system is directed toward the stress and it also stimulates your central nervous system in ways that cause stress on the heart, um, on your immune system, um, uh, frankly, on every aspect of your body because that when that stress happens, it triggers the sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. that then impacts every part of the body. So imagine children not knowing what to do, not knowing how to frame those issues. And so they just be, begin to integrate that stress without the tools to know how to cope with it. And that's what we really aim to address. Mm -hmm. Dave, let's follow up on this. There are economic considerations here without as doubt. well. Talk about them a little bit. Without a doubt. Uh, we're on the movement toward value-based care. Right, the old model was people get sick and then we pay claims. Pay for service. Pay for service. Moving right? away. Moving away. Value-based care. Get a flu shot. Don't get the flu. This is the same thing. And traditionally, health insurers haven't really been involved in social determinants. What Marianne's talking about is groundbreaking. Social determinants of health. Social determinants of health. It's groundbreaking. But we're talking about working with community health workers. We're talking about navigating the system. You get sick, you're not used to navigating the system. How do I find a good doctor? How do I get an appointment? How do we get there? We drive people to appointments. 
uh, all of that. There's a lot of things that cause issues, and there's a lot of people out there aren't getting the care that they need, and they don't know where to start, so we think we could help. It's interesting that uh, Horizon's also partnering with one of the other entities we know well, RWJ Barnabas Health, on these yes. social determinants of health. Is that a model that's happening more and more that organizations like yours, uh, health insurance providers, and and healthcare providers, hospital systems, are collaborating on these issues? Yes, we had an, really an amazing collaboration in the city of Newark in four zip codes with Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas, where we co-funded community health workers to address social determinants, the burden of where people live having such an impact on overall health. And social determinants, Dave talked about it and I've talked about it, but I don't want to assume people know what we're talking about. So social determinants are, so it's based on the theory that where I live has more to do with my overall health than anything else. My zip whether, code. My zip code, my block, my neighborhood. And so it's transportation, food insecurity, violence, even ability to have housing. How does housing impact what I do with my income? How do I distribute that? And so we have come together in an amazing program where we actually have an integrated team, both from Horizon and Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas, engaging the community, funding community health workers who are trusted and relevant to our members who are disproportionately impacted by social determinants. And over the next three years, we will be rolling that program now in four zip codes out to about 75 zip codes. It is powerful, and, and I'm curious about this. I mentioned the economic part. Other than making a difference in people's lives, does this have the potential, Dave, to actually lower overall health care costs? Without a doubt. Um, Value-based care. Think about getting a flu shot right. versus waiting until you get the flu and getting admitted to the hospital. This is the same thing. We think if we can help people early on, help people stay healthy, they're going to be out of the hospital. Uh, they're going to go see their doctor when they ought to see their doctor. Preventive care pay off, pays off big time at the end of the day. We believe that there's a real ROI in this uh, for us. We are doing it because it's the right thing to do, but we do think there's an ROI in it for us too. And finally, as it relates to ACEs, um, the whole question of early intervention mm -hmm. is also part of what Dave's talking about as well. Absolutely. Is adverse childhood experiences stepping in earlier as opposed to saying, well, you know, you'll get through it and, or, or just ignoring it as a society is incredibly irresponsible, not to mention incredibly expensive. Absolutely. And that's why as we roll out this, our value-based strategy and our social determinant strategy, we will integrate the training to identify ACEs into every person that touches that child. So the identification is immediate right. and the intervention is immediate as well. I want to thank you both for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Steve. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at steveadubato. We are thrilled once again to be joined by Christine Norbert Beyer, who is Commissioner of New Jersey Department of Children and Families. Good to see you, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you. Nice to be here. This subject... Right. There's research about this. There's a report coming yeah. out. There's some private funding from a couple of foundations, the Burke Foundation, the Nicholson Foundation, $2 million of seed money to be involved in this. Yeah. Um, why are these horrific experiences for children, for children so important to well, all of us? I was going to say it's important because it's not specific to any one group. Um, you know, when we think about child abuse and adversity, you know, that happens in childhood, you know, lots of times it's easier to think it's happening to someone else or it happens to, you know, those people over there, when in reality what the study showed, the ACES study, is that, um, you know, adversity in childhood really is very prevalent and um, it touches everybody. I think the original study said 67% right. of individuals have at least one adversity in their childhood. By the way, when the commissioner re refers to ACEs, that is in fact adverse childhood experiences yeah, as a sorry. study yeah. about this. <clears throat> and by the way, for those, it's interesting, you were with us the first time on State of Affairs. You talked about your department mm -hmm. and part of what is going on is trying to educate the public as to who you are, yeah. what you do, and why it matters. How has that evolved 
over the last, say, six months? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it continues to evolve. And um, there's a lot of work that we've been doing, that I've been doing out meeting with families, meeting with constituents. Um, I started a listening tour. And so really having the opportunity to listen directly to the families that we serve every day, the youth that we serve who, you know, receive our services or, um, you know, live in some of the programs um, that we fund throughout the state, you know, we've, I've been, in getting to hear from them, it really has been eye-opening. Um, and while um, the services, I think, are um, really helpful for those families, um, you know, I've, what I'm finding is it's not enough, there's not enough. What are they it's, looking for from the department? Um, you know, I think- Or from government overall? I think most times when people think about um, the work that we do in our department, uh, they do think child abuse and neglect, and so it's about it's you a know, big piece of it, but not the totality well, of it. Well, that's right, and that's some of what we talked about. And so, you know, my opportunity now to hear from families has really been about um, that they're struggling financially. That um, you know, I think you have had on other shows about childcare. And, that's right. That's um, part of our know. commissioner. Great segue. Yeah. The right from the start NJ initiative. You'll see it up right there. Uh, birth to three. Yeah. And, yeah. and you, and, you and, and Carol Johnson, other members of the administration, we talked to the Commissioner of Health yeah. today as well, okay. Dr. Elton Hall. Several agencies, several departments in state government responsible for children in one way or another, right? Absolutely, yeah. And the Department of Education. That's I would right. say, you know, that we partner together probably four or five departments um, pretty significantly on some really serious issues that impact children, and, excuse me, children and families. And that includes this ACEs issue. It's interesting, it doesn't fall simply into your department. No, I think that you know we work to prevent ACEs. We work to prevent child abuse through prevention initiatives and prevention efforts. Um, but yeah, it's not. I mean, it's a health crisis. You know, toxic stress, um, how that impacts children. It impacts their ability to learn. And so the work that we then um, do with the Department of Education um, and our other partners in the community, it's a public health crisis. And so it's not one department is you know, not going to solve this. We were talking to the First Lady uh, about this issue as well, and she seems uh, extremely engaged and yeah. interested. There are several members of the administration mm -hmm. here tonight. Why is a night like this? We're folks in the private sector mm -hmm. together, foundations, corporations, and leaders in government like yourself and the First Lady here. What do you expect out of a night like this? Well, I think it raises awareness that it's not, you know, it's not just a government issue, um, that it's really public-private partnership. And, you know, that's the way I think that we do some of our best work, and that's how we're going to get the best results for the residents of our state. Um, and, you know, we're going to improve outcomes for children is... Um, is through public-private partnership. And some of the, you know, the best... Um, Things that I've been involved with in the past, both in New Jersey and you know working nationally, was when public and private comes together. So when it comes to ACEs, uh, um, adverse childhood um, situations, adverse childhood experiences, if you will, do you see this commissioner as? I don't want to overstate it. An, a national epidemic. Um, I don't know that is it's it a, a crisis. Do you know what? It's, um, it's a significant issue that needs to be addressed. I think there's a moral imperative around addressing ACEs. You I mean, know, for all of us. For across the country. Someone says, yeah. that's not my kid, that's not good enough. Do you know what? Because it impacts every child. It's not just kids who are involved with protective services. There are majority of families um, where children are living in adversity every day, they're living with toxic stress every day, um, that never rise to the attention or the level of our department. And I think that's what's so powerful about this, is that it's not those people over there, it's us in this room. Well, if 67% um, have uh, at least one childhood, yeah, adversity in childhood. The majority have. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and there's a lot of it before I, you know, because I know there are a whole range of other things going on tonight, including the event we want to be sensitive to the commissioner's time. What, what I'm curious about is you, you try to prevent is one thing, but mm -hmm. then to deal with, to treat, to help, it's the other part of it, right? 
Absolutely. I think we were having a conversation earlier today uh, with Dr. Burke Harris, and she was saying it's kind of a chicken and the egg situation. You wrote a very compelling book on this subject. Oh, right. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hearing her speak about this, you know, can really, I think, convert a lot of people to why this topic is so important. Um, but it really is kind of a chicken and the egg thing where... Um, you know, we need to treat, we need to try and prevent ACEs, but then we also need to treat them. And it's kind of like what comes first. If we don't help individuals as children um, have their ACEs mitigated um, or someone step in to try and help them resolve issues and, you know, they grow up to be adults that um, then have Are they more health likely? issues or, and then, you know, the cycle can repeat. Of adverse childhood experiences. Yeah, yeah. The cycle continues. Yeah, yeah. Um, Commissioner, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you. It, like you said, it's interesting. There are many departments, many members of the cabinet, Absolutely. governor's cabinet dealing with this issue, and we appreciate you joining us again. Yeah, thank you so much. You got it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, PNC Bank, RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by Guarini Institute for Government and Leadership at St. Peter's University. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Cecilia Zalkin. It costs much more to care for an infant than for an older child, and many New Jersey child care centers don't have the funding they need. Because of this, many children in New Jersey don't have their basic needs met. Right from the start, NJ is dedicated to supporting this vulnerable population, children from birth to age three. We know that the early years are the most critical, and we believe that every child deserves a bright beginning and a healthy future.